Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montia, and you are watching PBS Books. PBS Books is pleased to partner with the Association for the Study of African American Life and History for this evening's event. Thank you for joining us to celebrate Black History Month as we focus on African American health and inequities, which is part of ASALA's annual 2022 conference supporting their theme of African American health and wellness. Tonight's program highlights two trailblazers, author and scholar Harriet Washington in conversation with Dr. Samuel Roberts. This month, PBS Books celebrates the one year anniversary of our partnership with Asala. We launched a new relationship with Asala to ensure that African-American trailblazers are heard throughout the year. From highlighting Mae Jemison to Jarvis Givens to Cornell West, Michelle Duster, Evie Shockley, we aim to share diverse voices of amazing Americans who have contributed so much. Amplifying their voice across the country through libraries and PBS stations. Our programs and our partnership have been a huge success. Thank you for tuning in and joining the conversation. To kick off tonight's conversation, tonight's event, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Marvin Delaney, President of Asala. Welcome. Good evening. I am Marvin Delaney, President of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, or ASALA, the acronym we use for our organization. ASALA was founded by Dr. Carter G. Woodson in 1915. In 1926, Dr. Woodson initiated the celebration of Negro History Week, which corresponded with the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. In 1976, this celebration was expanded to include the entire month of February. And today, Black History Month garners support throughout the country as people of all ethnic and social backgrounds discuss the Black experience. Asala views the promotion of Black History Month as one of the most important components of advancing Dr. Woodson's legacy. In promoting the study of African-American history, Dr. Woodson did not work alone. There were many others who worked with him from the beginning of Asala. And Asala has always had partners who supported our efforts to promote Black History Month as well as the study of African-American life in history. One such example has been Asala's partnership with PBS Books. Initially, Asala and PBS Books set out with a modest goal of partnering to present four programs. I'm elated to report the success of our joint venture has grown over the past year and has allowed us to present more than 15 programs. I would like to now thank our esteemed scholars author, Dr. Harriet Washington, and Dr. Samuel Roberts for agreeing, to, for agreeing to join us here for an exploration into this timely topic of Black health inequities in the past, today, and looking to the future. And now, without further delay, we will hear a rendition of the Negro National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, performed by the 105 Voices of History, HBCU National Choir. Thank you.
beautiful voices and, a, and an amazing way to launch into our program this evening. Thank you, Dr. Duvain, Dulvaney. Excuse me, Delaney. I'm so sorry. But this is the thing. Tonight is such an important conversation. It's not a light conversation, but it's so current. And that's why PBS Books is thrilled to host it. We're thrilled to be here and to, to have a platform to be able to share this critical content across this country. So as a medical ethicist, Harriet Washington has a unique and courageous voice and deconstructs the politics around medical issues, including scientific racism. In this conversation this evening, she will share about the powerful and disturbing portrait of medicine, race, sex, and the abuse of power. Her latest book, Carte Blanche, The Erosion of Medical Consent, documents the alarming tale of how the rights of Americans to say no to risky medical research is being violated. So now the moment you've been waiting for, it's my pleasure actually to introduce Harriet Washington. Harriet, as many of you know, she's a prolific writer, science writer, editor, and ethicist, who is the author of the seminal Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medicine, Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present. It won the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Penn Oakland Award, the, the ALA American Library Association Black Caucus Nonfiction Award and five, and she's also written and had well-received five other amazing books, including A Terrible, Way to, to, Terrible Thing to Waste, Environmental Racism, and Its Assault on the American Mind, and Carte Blanche. Washington is a Renaissance woman. Breaking through glass ceilings, she has won numerous fellowships, including she has been a fellow at Harvard Medical School, the New York Academy of Medicine, Stanford University, the National Center for Bioethics, at, and many others. She teaches bioethics at Columbia University, where she has delivered many, uh, in 2020, commencement speech for Columbia University public health graduates. and. She won Columbia's 2020 Mailman School of Public Health, Public Health Leadership Award. Washington continues to contribute in so many ways, not only in academic journals, but also in popular publications, including Nature, American Journal of Public Health, New England Journal of Medicine, and more. We're so fortunate to have her here, and I'd like to welcome Harriet Washington. Thank you so much for that generous introduction. Thank you for inviting me here. I am so excited about this, especially the chance to be in conversation with Dr. Roberts, so thank you. Well, thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Samuel Roberts. Dr. Roberts is the director of Columbia University's Institute for Research in African American Studies, Associate Professor of History and Associate Professor of Sociomedical Sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health. He writes, teaches, and lectures widely on African American history, medical and public health history, urban history, issues of policing, criminal justice, and the history of social movements. He also composed, uh, wrote a book, Infectious Fear, Politics, Disease, and Effects of Segregation, which demonstrates the historical and continuing links between legal and de facto segregation and poor health outcomes. Dr. Roberts currently is researching, outcome, uh, researching a book um, on the history of drug addiction policy and politics from the 1950s to present day. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Roberts. Thank you so much, Heather Marie. By the way, I, that, that you might have gotten that from an out-of-date website. I'm no longer the director of the Institute for Research in African-American Studies. Uh, that, yeah. 
<laughs> That's my good colleague, Mabel Wilson. I still have any emails asking me about the Institute. I'm no longer in that role. So, so yeah. Well, you do so very much, which is why it is so incredible mm -hmm. that we are able to have you here to be able to speak with Harriet, because I feel like both of you have such an amazing perspective on African-American health and the inequities, the past, the present, the future, and what things we can all learn, not only uh, for people who are in the industry, but those of us who, like me, don't know a lot about, about it. So if, without further ado, it is my pleasure to hand it over to you to enjoy the conversation. Thank you both so much for being here and um, thank you for your, your many contributions. Thank you so much, Heather Marie, and, and thank you to all the staff at PBS Books, and thank you to Asala and the staff there. This has been a, a remarkable collaboration between two organizations that I've long admired since my childhood, actually, so to, to be a part of this has been great. Uh, Harriet, you and I have been on a number of panels right. over the years, and particularly since the pandemic. And I have to say, after each one, I, they were, they've all been fun and interesting. I've learned so much from engaging with you. But after each one, I always, I've always thought, I want to interview Harriet Washington. That's where I, I, I mean, it's been fun being on a panel with you, but I want to be the one to interview you. So I guess uh, this is my, uh, my, uh, my wish come true, so to speak. So it's good to see you. How have yeah. you been? Fine. And that's a great honor. I feel like it's inverted. I should be interviewing you, but you know. Well, <laughs> next time, we'll be supposed to bring us both back. Oh, good job. Yeah. <laughs> so let's, I want to get right into it. Um, I, and I do want to get to your recent book, which I, which I love um, and it just really knocked me over. Um, but I want to start with the, the beginning, so to speak. Uh, in 2008, I believe it was, or two, yeah, it was 2008 when medical that apartheid. 2007, actually. Seven. Okay. I'm yeah. sorry. I, I beg your pardon. In 2007, uh, this was, I mean, this book changed the discussion in so many ways. And in, in, in some ways, it's almost hard to think about a time in our, in our political discussions about healthcare when this book wasn't around. Um, and it, it's, it's, you know, it's only been 15 years, but it's, it made that sort of an impact that it's kind of something that we all read, we all discussed, um, all thought about. What has, I guess I have a, this is a two-part question. What has been the afterlife of this book? I'm sure a lot of people are picking it up either again or maybe even for the first time since the pandemic and what we discovered in April of 2020 about the health disparities and health inequities of COVID. So I want to know about kind of, you know, what is, what is its afterlife since then? What have been, have the past, I guess, what, 15 years or so have been for this it's book? Had a, it's had a roller coaster ride. Very interesting. Um, even before it was published, I was happened to sit on an AMA panel, and one of the members there made it very clear that he disliked the book, he felt it was filled with falsehoods, and shared that with everybody there. And I thought, that's interesting because the book isn't finished yet. <laughs> My editor hasn't read it. He hasn't read it, <laughs> but he knew that he didn't like it. And there was a, you know, a cohort of people who indeed took that view. They doubted that the things I said could be true because certainly that's not what you read in the history of medicine. The canon did not include that information. A lot of skepticism, but that was one small cohort, but they were a very uh, visible co cohort. What I found interesting though, and then among academia, the receptions were missed. Some, some people thought it was wonderful. You know, some people were, um, thought that I indeed had taken a perspective that had never been taken and that needed to be taken. And I had essentially done what I set out to do, which was correct the canon of the history of medicine, which has carefully elided the experience of African-Americans and corrected it. But then there were people who doubted it. And then lay people I found interesting seemed to just love it. I mean, they were um, thirsty for this kind of book because it, corroborated things that they already knew. They had personally experienced it. Their families had felt it. They had lived through it. They had oral histories passed down. And so it was a huge relief to them to have someone validate and say, yes, this actually happened and I can prove it. So we had that mixed response at first. As time went on, I, people warmed to the book. I was getting a lot more positive response than negative, but you're right. When the pandemic struck, it gained a second life. 
Um, many people who had um, not read it before did. Sales skyrocketed alarmingly at first. And um, I think it just, people are ready for this work. They are ready to understand that questioning the history of medicine canon is not the same thing as disparaging medicine or disparaging doctors. And people are just hungry to understand the quandary we find ourselves in now where our understanding of race threatens to, um, you know, sabotage our ability to maintain health for all people. Um, younger medical students are ready for this. They want to know, they want to um, do everything they can to be, to improve, and they're willing to admit the errors of the past. So it's been a roller coaster ride. I feel very gratified and very happy that it seems to have found its audience and that people do, do accept it and, um, are excited to learn more. That's that's great to hear. And I, I actually, I don't think I knew about the negative reception at first. I can't say I'm entirely surprised. I've spoken before some of those audiences myself, but um, it, it seems like in the end, this is this is the book that uh, maybe arrived a little bit before its time, at least for some people, but certainly is sticking around for a long time to come. I've used it in my classes and, and in so many other ways. So I've, it's, thank you so much for that. There's there's also something in that book um, that I think is a theme that resonates through much of the rest of your work, which is you have a way of looking at medical racism as not just about you know racist doctors, you know you know what we call you know white men in white coats, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's certainly part of it. I mean, there are some there are some very despicable deeds that are done by some you know pretty unsavory characters. They've in, been active, in, in, yes. <laughs> yeah, they're they're active in their um, yeah, in their misdeeds, shall we say? But there's there's you're not satisfied with just that. That you're also looking at the systems. You know what at what Cedric Robinson called you know, racial capitalism. You know where yeah. where our economic system meets our system of racism, and that's what underlies. I mean, you've got a, a Heather Marie mentioned two of your books, but I also want to, I might actually forget a few of them here, but I just, I've, I've made a short list and I hope I haven't, and forgive me if I've missed some of them. After that, you co-wrote a book um, with Stephen Bach about living with hepatitis C or he healthy living with hepatitis, living healthy with hepatitis C, um, which uh, I have not had a chance to read that, but it seems like this was something in 2008 of, you know, treatment for hepatitis C was actually very different from what it is now. Exactly. You know? So this was certainly a contribution to patients and people living with that with that condition. After I should, that, I should I was, go ahead, point, please. Point out that Stephen Bach was not my co-author. He was kind enough to write a foreword to the book. I am so yeah. sorry. Okay, yeah. all right, all right, yeah. Amazon is a co-author, so it's easy to make them. It's, it's Amazon's mistake here, not yeah, yours. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's uh, this is what happens when you do use Google for your research. I apologize <laughs> for that. But right after that, and I did read uh, Deadly Monopolies. Uh -huh. which is, you know, truly an indictment of racial capital or of capitalism, certainly. D uh, Deadly Monopoly is the shocking corporate takeover of life itself and the consequences for your health and our medical future. That was 2011. Um, soon after followed in 2015 by infectious madness, the surprising science of how we, quote unquote, catch mental illness. And that was very surprising, by the way. I, I read an advanced copy of that, as you know, and I was... Uh, yeah, my, I had to pick my job off my desk. <laughs> After that, um, and now we have carte blanche, which is uh, carte blanche, the erosion of medical consent, which came out, um, actually, I think it's it's scheduled to come out next week. I, I no, no, it came out heard. last year, actually. I'm sorry, I'm re misreading that. It's, it's February of 2021. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, that's the theme that goes in there. And I want to ask you, what is the trajectory? Because there's also ways in which these books when you read one, if you've read the previous one, you could say, oh yeah, that might be the logical question with which she was left after writing, you know, Deadly Monopolies. You know, where do I go? Where does she go after this? Can you just tell, show us, you know, take us behind the curtain. What's your process like? Your research process and also the conceptual process. The conceptual process is uh, hard for me to delineate because the truth is I have a million things I want to write about and I can't do that, right? But the things that I ultimately invest time and energy and my passion in tend to have something important in common. I sometimes see developments in medicine or health that seem to be, if not countenance, then widely accepted. 
maybe passively accepted, but accepted. But I don't find them acceptable. And more to the point, I, I know that it's my opinion, no one is explaining these things intelligibly to lay people. You know, doctors and scientists and ethicists will discuss them at length, decide that it's appropriate to do them, but nobody's consulted the people who are gonna ultimately pay the price. You know, the patients, the subject, they don't even know what they, what they tend to read are versions that in my opinion are boulderized and sanitized. For example, mm. tremendously risky research that is performed without anybody asking your opinion, but it's presented to you as a cutting edge, you know, new development that you are lucky enough to be, be one of the first to participate in. No, it's not. You're asking me to be a research, research subject and you're serving the needs of other people, but you're not being told that. I just felt that not explaining to people clearly what's transpiring is the same thing as lying to people. And so with Deadly Monopolies, which I'm so happy you mentioned that, in some ways it's really my favorite book and yet few people have read it, <laughs> but Deadly Monopolies, you know, capitalism has got a great deal to do with the problems we're facing today, including racial health care disparities, but also including the things like in this country, white people and just like black people cannot afford their medications. Why? So I wanted to look behind the curtain and find out how the patent system has catalyzed this complete, um, this utter separation of people from the drugs they need. At the same time, it's telling people that the system is what allows them to have medication. So um, I wanted to elucidate things for everyday people. They could make their own decisions about what are the things transpiring are correct or safe or things they want to be a part of or not. I see far too little accommodation for informing people of um, the realities they need to know to make decisions or, or hiding things from people that if they understood completely, they would probably rise up and insist that things change. Um, I just wanted to be that person who's like speaking for people who don't have a voice and explaining things to people in a way that I think, I think is more honest and useful than what they're used to hearing. I want to press you a bit on that one as well, maybe to give us some of the vignettes to, um, to illustrate what you just said. I, the one that came to mind as, as you were just speaking was the woman who had been shot and she's picked up by the ambulance and given an experimental treatment that's pretty much completely inappropriate for her condition. Um, but there's there's so many more others in there. Could you just give our audience, for those who haven't, it, it came out a year ago, and so I, I imagine that many of our listeners or our viewers tonight haven't had a chance to pick up a copy. Could you just tell us a bit, when you when you say that people are, are being lied to, that you know lack of informed consent is right. essentially the same as lying, to draw that out in like literally a visceral way. You know, how is that? How does that play out, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. I actually just spoke with her yesterday um, online. How is she? How is she doing, by the she's way? She's doing well. You know, she's recovered well, considering what she went through. She's recovered well. She's mobile. She's in her own home. She's, um, you know, she's she's good. Much better than, you know, I kind of feared for her initially. Yeah, so, I'm glad yeah. to hear that. Thank you. Please continue, yeah. though. I'm sorry. Um. Anyway. Um, this woman, um, she was at home with her boyfriend one day when burglars bro broke in, home invasion. The men were armed and they demanded she give them money. And when she said, I have no money in the house, they shot her. They shot her in the, ch um, in the chest. But unfortunately, the impact of the gun also um, injured her retina. So, you know, she lost her sight, but she was bleeding to death. Luckily, her son, she called her son, called an ambulance, and came to her house in Detroit, picked her up and got her to the hospital. But when the ambulance got there, EMTs didn't first rush in and pick her up. First, they stopped to open a manila, manila envelope. Manila envelope had a computer printout that told them how to treat her. What, would she get the standard of care? known to sane people till they get to the hospital? Or would she get a new experimental tr um, patented um, fluid called polyheme, meant as a blood substitute? 
Polyheme had been tested in a hospital study in which so many people died and had heart attacks, the study had to be ended. Polyheme never got FDA approval, but here it is being tested on people with no one asked her if she wanted to be in a study. No one told her she'd get into something experimental. Um, she's unconscious. And so they gave her this, took her to the hospital. She said she woke up at some point and said, well, I woke up and saw they were giving me blood. And I told her ambulances don't carry blood. That wasn't blood, that was polyheme. So she gets to the hospital and uh, they managed to keep her alive. She has, you know, very, um, extensive surgery, she survives. But she in the hospital, people were taking samples and blood from her. And these were not people caring for her. They're people in the experiment. They're trying to find out whether the polyheme was, was working. So um, at the end, she did, she did recover. She did survive. She's doing pretty well today, as I said. But in the end, she told them, her daughter told her, you're in a medical study an experiment. No one else had told her. She said, I want out of it. They have to ask my permission. And they tried to say to her, listen, it's a cutting edge study. We think it's going to benefit you. She said, you didn't ask me. That's not right. I want out. And they said, okay, we'll withdraw you. But what, what did withdrawing her mean? They can't take the polyheme out of, out of her blood they've infused already. No, withdrawing just meant they wouldn't use her data, supposedly. And when the final data from the study were collated, they found out that polyheme um, caused more heart attacks and more deaths than the standard of care. You had people who died in a medical experiment they ne never knew that they were in. And this has been a pattern with this kind of um, blood substitute. There have been at least eight types tested. Only one was ever approved and that's in South Africa. All the others had the same problems more heart attacks, more deaths, and yet they continue to test it. And they do it without asking people's permission. And a lot of people might assume that that's illegal, but it's not because in 1996, the Code of Federal Regulations was changed to allow people who are trauma victims to be enrolled in medical research without their permission. Now, who agreed to this? Doctors, ethicists, officials, nobody asked everyday people if they wanted this. And so it was made into law very quietly. And as a result, we have had, um, I don't think anybody knows the actual number, but I counted a minimum of four, um, of 40,000 people approximately who've been used in research without anybody asking their permission. Mm. You know, uh, <clears throat> there's a, around the time that medical apartheid came out, there's this, this discussion in public health about medical mistrust. Why do African Americans mistrust doctors? And the answer, you know, this was, you know, quite often many of the, the, the opinion pieces were written by white public health officials or, you know, researchers. The answer was, oh, it's the legacy of Tuskegee. And this was, I think, before your book came out. Was when this is like you know the early aughts or so. It's a perennial, you, yes. <laughs> yeah, you've clearly laid that to rest in in subsequent books. But what you just said also reminded me that you know neither was Tuskegee actually a secret either. I mean, they were publishing fairly regularly, about every what four or five years or so, they were publishing. So there were, like you said, there were physicians who were well aware of what was going on. Kind of like as you're saying, physicians agreed to this as well i um i neglect and i knew i was going to do this unfortunately it was written down but i still forgot there is also on your list um in 2019 uh which might have been the last time you and i shared a physical space together this is before the pandemic yeah. i was at the at your at your book launch um a terrible thing to waste environmental racism and its assault on the american mind which i highly recommend for i recommend all of your books for our viewers but i, I want to pivot to that one as well because um, that book came after, I believe, directly after uh, Infectious Madness. Right. Correct. Is that right? right? So, what's the what's the link between? And I, I got to say, I mean, like, uh, I, I work in history of medicine and public health, and so some of the things that you describe, if I didn't know them, they weren't entirely surprising because you know you and I work in a similar field. But I got to say, the 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 mental health stuff uh, really threw me for a loop. So, if you could draw it a bit about the connection between these two books. On one hand, the first book is, as you call it, I believe, the surprising science behind how madness can actually be infected, mm -hmm. infective. 
infectious rather. But then in a terrible thing to waste, this I mean, this is I mean, this is a really dark book. I mean, it's valuable, but I mean, it's not um, it's not feel good reading at all. You, it, it's in this book where you elucidate how environmental exposures, toxins, um, you know, waste, uh, particulate matter actually is a detriment to our minds, particularly our young children. Yeah. Yes. Um, can you g give us a bit about that? Because I think that's the part that really also needs to be heard as well. That's true. You know, exposure to noxious environmental toxins, generally the pr a product of industrial, you know, neglect and governmental neglect. That exposure uh, cripples the minds. I shouldn't use the word cripple. I know that's a terrible choice of words, but it assails the minds and brains of people. And our testing has been done so poorly that we actually haven't seen it. I learned a great deal about this from talking to Philip Grangin, um, who's at the Harvard School of Public Health. And he's done some really incisive testing to discover that the industrial chemicals are tested. Um, and then you have industry scientists saying, our tests show they don't really harm people. But the way they test the drugs, uh, the chemicals is very, um, inadequate. For one thing, a lot of the harm is done on the minds, on, on the brains of fetuses and children under two. At that age, 85% of their metabolic budget goes to building a brain. If they're also being assailed by toxins, they can't do both. They can't fight off the effect of the toxin and build a brain. And you have subtle and sometimes not so subtle derangements that only show up as aberrant behaviors 10 or 15 years later. 15 years later, you've got a kid with conduct disorder or a kid who's got uh, beginning criminal, begins a criminal past or who's, who has um, um, all kinds of intellectual deficits. And it's hard at that point to connect it to what happened to him when he was a fetus. But the truth is that people who live in these um, environmental, these seeds of environmental toxins are, are assailed by many of them. And we don't know the synergistic effects. They're all working on them at once and they are all damaging the minds. So Grand Jean has written a book about um, how they damage the minds um, of adults too, but of young people in a way that we fail to pick up and how industrial chemists and in, in industry mm. um, manipulates testing. So they'll, they'll test something in adults and it may not harm the adult at all, but it could be devastating at a much smaller dose to the brain of a child. And so with intelligence, one of the things that also I, drove me to write that because it's so important is that unfortunately the hereditarian scientists have been very influential in convincing Americans that people of color have lower intelligence and that and they have that lower intelligence because it's genetic, they're passing it on. That's their claim. Their claim does not stand up to scientific scrutiny, but people are often, um, their authority derives very often from the fact that they're prestigious institutions. You know, Shockley was at Harvard. You know, you have um, um, the author of the bell curve and all these um, academics who believe in this have something else in common that the newspaper reports ignore. And that is they have, political ambitions. Almost every one of them has actually worked with uh, lawmakers to make sure that laws are put into place that punish people of color for, ha for low intelligence. For example, Shockley joined the California legislature and put into, proposed a bill that people, women of color on welfare um, should not be received it, should not be able to receive it because they were gonna have children who would be low intelligence and perpetuate and drag down the intellect of Americans. You know, it sounds so bizarre, but these are not ancient things. Richard um, Richwine at Harvard proposed that Hispanic Americans should not be allowed to immigrate because as he said, and as he noted in his, in his PhD thesis, he claimed that Hispanic people are not only low intelligence and it's passed on hereditarily, but he passed, he also claims that they have a tendency to criminality and they're actually listened to. And I want people to remember that yes, they are scientists, but they also have political agenda and they also to almost to a man are funded by the Pioneer Fund, a group that openly 
um, states its mission as a preservation of a Western society, Western civilization. <laughs> so a racist agenda uh, shrouded in science is, um, is acting against um, any attempts to address the real causes of intellectual de um, deficiency. The real causes are exposure mm -hmm. to lead, exposure to you know vitamin D, vitamin D deficiency, all kinds of things that are rooted in biology and are correctable, but we're not correcting them. Instead, we're focusing on genetic studies um, to debate whether and, and how much people of color uh, are suffering because of their ancestry and therefore, but it's not true. So I thought it really, really important to write this book and make people understand that what we're looking at is something engineered and perpetuated by greed. You know, companies don't want to clean up the environmental toxins because it would cost a lot of money. Very short-sighted. They'd be better off if they did it, but that's another story. And um, so I think that's really, really important. Infectious madness ties into this because, again, exposure rather than genetics and inheritance is, has been given short shrift. I think that the traditional cause of mental illness certainly are valid and true causes. Stress, genetics all play a role, but a big role is also played by um, exposure to toxins that we know damage the nervous system and damage the brain, causing mental mm -hmm. illness. We're aware of that. We just tend not to look at the etiology that way. For example, we all know rabies, right? We all know it's infectious and that it makes people violent and it affects their brains, but we don't think of it that way. There's so many other exposures that affect people's um, behavior, um, cognitive abilities, and we're kind of locked into this um, habit of thought where we always want to look at genetics and try to indict some tiny little genetic difference to explain things. Mm. I want to pick that up, but first, um... Our hosts have been so kind to, to put us together for this. I've been really enjoying this conversation. I almost forgot to uh, to uh, mention them again. I want to tell our viewers, uh, I'm with Harriet Washington, the author of so many books, most recently of Carte Blanche, about the erosion of medical consent. My name is Samuel Roberts, and our hosts this evening uh, in collaboration are the Public Broadcasting System and the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And this is uh, part of their year-long collaboration. Uh, Harriet, where, you, where we just left off, we were talking about the kind of monetary uh, incentives for this. And you seem to imply in your books that there is something specifically American about this. And you mentioned that ethical codes in Europe are actually a bit more rigorous, at least certain parts of Europe anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think you mentioned perhaps, I think there's one comparison um, in your most recent book with Norway, it might have been. I think it was a Northern European country. But um, I guess the question that I have then is, where, how is it that what happens here is so just preposterously detrimental to particularly Black people's health, but really to all of our health, really? Um, the Nuremberg Code, which you know led in short you know short time to the Helsinki Declaration, that was in reaction to what happened in Europe, but certainly everyone around the world knew about it and you know was concerned. But yet, our ethical system, our our, our history of our ethics, seemed to indicate. So you, you know, very uh, cogently argue that that quickly eroded. Like yes. What, is it is it are we is this again back to the monetary incentives which are you know much more robust here than they are in many of our peer nations or is there something else going on um both are going on the monetary element is huge in this country it's a huge influence but there's also um other motivations researchers have motivations that are not monetary but are very strong for example we don't talk about how researchers benefit from doing research. The talk, we always talk about how it, we hope it will benefit um, the people that they're, they're taking for subjects. And this creates an idea that researchers are, have this unalloyed beneficence, right? They're only doing it in order to help people. 
they are doing it to help people. I like to, I think in most cases, but they're also helping themselves. Successful research will benefit the researcher by not only allowing them to make money, sometimes a lot of money, but also by um, uh, professional advancement. Um, this prestige of running a large multi-central cl clinical trial, um, mm. the ability to recruit the best people, uh, stature in his institution, Nobel prizes, all these things are incentives to do research. Now, there's nothing wrong with for researcher benefiting from research, but I think there is something wrong with researcher pretending that he's not benefiting and he's only doing it to benefit other people. That's simply not true, and that's what we but that's what we tend to hear. So the things um, that benefit researchers do include money, though, especially now. And in deadly monopolies, I talk about the fact that when the patent system changed in this country in 1980. And it was not a good change, I think, for most people, but it was a great change for um, corporations and for medical centers because now medical centers could um, give their patented, their discoveries, their patent discoveries to institutions, to, um, to corporations. They couldn't do that before. The corporations now could take from the medical center, from the university, uh, a molecule that had patented, and they could make a profit from it. They could sell it, they could make a medication. And so it was promoted to general people as saying, this will allow us to have many, many, and much better medications. But what has it really done? You know, 70 years down the line, what's happened? Well, what's actually happened is that we have 17 drugs for erectile dysfunction, and far too few for malaria. Maybe one came up for malaria in the past couple mm. of years. And so the drugs that are coming down the pike are drugs that will make a lot of money, become blockbusters, make a billion dollars a year. They're not the drugs that people need. They're the drugs that will be the most profitable. And that's why we have a lot of drugs for things like um, stomach upset. You know, Doctors could tell their patients, um, eat less, exercise more, but now we have pills. You know that people can take instead and have the illusion that they're addressing their problems. It's very, very common, stomach upset, right? All the types and drug companies make a lot of money on it. So money is dictating the direction of medical research. Before 1980, researchers were motivated by things like wanting to be seen as a benefactor um, and other things that were aligned with the needs of the populace. When polio was raging, Everyone wanted to be the first one with the polio vaccine, right? Big contention about the two people uh, gradually emerged with one. The point, though, to me was that they were trying to come up with a solution for a real problem affecting a lot of people that we needed desperately. Now the solutions are focused not on things that we need desperately necessarily. They're focused on profitable things. So that's why I said patent is very important. And not getting people's informed consent also have a financial impetus because it takes, a, FDA only gives a few years for drug approval and it's expensive. And um, getting people to consent, to agree to the trial, informing them, getting their consent is lengthy, which means it's expensive. If you can dispense with informed consent, you can get your drug um, approved really quickly if you're lucky and um, make much more money. The quicker you get FDA approval, the longer you have a the longer you have a patent that you can exploit. And so this actually inspires people, you know, to dispense with informed consent. It becomes too expensive. So unfortunately, the um, financial impetus is um, works against ethics. It works against what people actually need. And often, as you make clear, um, particularly in your most recent book, Carte Blanche, but in your other work as well, that sometimes we will, we meaning the researchers, not me personally or you, um, will privilege, you know, this pursuit of a new drug or a new procedure when it's pretty clear that the ones that we already have in place are just as effective or more effective. And but because they've gone off patent. Exactly. That they're not making anybody any money. So we, we meaning, you know, them really, they have to reinvent something so they can get the, the money for it. We only have a couple of minutes left. And I knew this was going to happen, that I was going to just completely lose track of time in this discussion. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. So I'm allowed one last question. Uh, our, our hosts are telling me. Um, 
what's next? What are you, can you tell us, are you allowed to tell us what, what your next <laughs> book is going to be or what, what's the, what, who are you taking on next? If I only knew, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I actually am entertaining the idea of doing something very different next. To be honest, I think I, I need a break <laughs> from the um, unrelenting doom that from the um, really <laughs> difficult you know because <laughs> my other question is going to be do you ever get really sad for <laughs> after writing these books that actually was my other question yeah. so no yeah. actually i don't i'm a good person to write it because i love doing it. i feel like a detective so you know i like doing this huh. but i feel like i need a break so i'm actually toying with the idea of writing um biographies of several doctors and researchers that i really admire who hmm. lived in new york city um over the past few centuries and change the face of American medicine and culture, although people don't seem to realize it. So I'm really excited about this. <laughs> well, as are we to, to read it. I'm, I'm sure it's gonna be all that and more. Uh, I think we've hit our mark. Uh, thank you so much, Harriet Washington, author most recently of Carte Blanche, The Erosion of Medical Consent. And then previous to that, a terrible thing to waste environmental racism and its assault on the american mind and so many other wonderful titles as well thank you so much for what you've been doing for raising all of our awareness and advancing the conversation stay safe and be well i'm going to look out for those biographies and at some point hopefully we will see each other in person and yeah. uh be able to hang out I look thank you to that. thank you sam heather marie well, I am looking out for those biographies, and I'm also hoping that you guys will contact me whenever you you write books. This was an amazing conversation. I know I learned so very much. It was not the easiest conversation, right? Because it's it's heavy, it's upsetting, and I think, but it's knowledge, and knowledge is power. And if we walk around with ignorance, it's not doing any of us any good. So, thank you, Harriet. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your wisdom, your insights, for sharing your, even your process with us. And Dr. Robert Samuel, thank you so much for- My pleasure, thank you. For guiding the conversation. This has been amazing. I wanna thank Asala and Sylvia Cyrus um, for, for putting us all together, for letting us be a partner and enjoying this relationship and this partnership to amplify voices uh, throughout the year. Um, and we, we're looking forward to the next conversation that we're able to partner with all of you on. From PBS Books, we'd like to say good evening and happy reading. <laughs>